Okay, I'm, I'm, you want to warm me up? I am not going to show you a bear video. I know you're disappointed. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, and we've got the usual other rodents and things, right? I got otters on my property and stuff. I don't have a really good shot of a whale yet, just because they're far away. But there's this, there's a gray, we have a place on the coast, there's a gray whale hanging around. Like literally like he's a hobo. He, they, they sift muck in front of the, uh, and, and to get crustaceans and stuff out of him. So he's by himself. He's the size of a, like a full size uh, pickup truck with trailer, right? Maybe 30 tons. But they're like, Stoners, like they, they, when you're in your kayak, they will spy hop. They'll come up right beside you and look you square in you. Hey, how's it going? It's like you got a bong, like, and then they go back down again. So, um, so I, you know, I make a lot of podcasts. Anybody listen to any of the geek outs? So the geek outs were not my idea; they were Carl's idea, and it happened after the space shuttle Atlantis landed for the last time in 2011. And Carl and I were on the phone. And I ranted about how bad the space shuttle was for like 30 minutes. And when I finally wound down and Carl said, like, are you done? He said, we, we should have recorded that. Like, I don't think most people know the problems with the space shuttle. I'm like, nobody's going to listen to that. But I was wrong. So, so we've, made, we've made a bunch of geek outs over the years. And there's been some fun ones. Uh, the, fam the famous one for most folks was this moon-based geek out that I did in 2017. Now, I like technology. I've always liked technology, and I keep a lot of notes. I use OneNote extensively, and if I see a good story or something, I'll just or I'll organize it into topic areas, and I've always done that. I've done it for years. But as the geek out started to happen, what was exciting for me is it made me organize my thinking into an hour. Now, how can I tell this in a coherent narrative? And so the moon based geek out came from uh, the European Space Agency put out a paper saying, hey, we're really serious. We think technology has advanced to a point where it's feasible to have a laboratory on the moon, much like Antarctica, that you would send scientists to on a regular basis. And here's the kind of research we would do. And so, OK, I'll make a moon based talk. Uh, and I put that together. And then later that year, NASA called, which is a good day. Now, admittedly, they didn't actually call the emailed. I just didn't believe it at first. But finally, when I'm like, okay, if you're really from NASA, you can call me. And he calls, and no, it was really Chuck from NASA. And he said, hey, we really like your podcast. I'm like, well, that's cool. <laughs> and then he said, you know, wait, now he only knows me as a podcaster, right? So he says, would you ever do a presentation on, on the moon base? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. He goes, but to whom? He's like, well, to us. I'm like, <laughs> It's your stuff. <laughs> so, no, no, we like the way you tell it. So in, later in 2017, I got to go down to Ames. Re they asked me if I knew how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> I got to go down to the Ames Research Center, and this is on the front gate, and there was my name up on the front gate as the guest lecturer for My Mother is Proud. <laughs> and and, I, and, it's, I, and not to toot the horn too much, not the only time this has happened. So NASA likes my stuff. I did a bunch of stuff on, on uh, space telescopes. I got to meet the James Webb in person before they put it up into orbit. So this particular talk is an update on sort of the state of affairs in space uh, in the Western world. So I'm not going to talk a lot about China or India, although they have great space programs. I am include the bits and pieces from the Europeans. Uh, there's even a little Australian here. But we're going to I want to talk about the state of rocketry. So how are we getting into space? I want to talk about the state of space stations. What are we doing while we're up there? And then uh, the progress towards going back to the moon. We might go a little over time. If you want to ask questions, feel free. You know, it, I, this, I love this subject, and I, I literally worked on it all afternoon to refresh it. I have literally pieces from NASA press releases from today. And, there, and unfortunately, there's an Artemis briefing tomorrow, or I would have included that as well. Now, a few things that have happened recently that's really been a big deal in spaceflight, and that has been the sort of burst in tourism. Last year, a couple of the billionaires got a little crazy with their space experiments been going on for a long time, 
And on July 11th last year, Richard Branson, after many years of delay, finally did a flight in Spaceship Two. Now, this was originally a vehicle developed by Paul, the late, great Paul Allen, and uh, they upgraded, uh, Virgin bought it, it, expanded it. They had a terrible accident that cost the uh, lives of one of the test pilots and granted them for quite a while. And now he suddenly rushed to deliver this. And they got a flight. Now these are only ballistic flights. So a carrier ship called the White Knight 2 picks up Spaceship 2, takes about 45 minutes or so to get up to altitude. And then uh, Spaceship 2 drops off White Knight, fires its engine, rockets up to above the Kármán line, which is about 100 kilometers, about 380,000 feet, and then begins to fall. Now, at that time, you get a couple of minutes of free fall. And if you want to float around, you do. Uh, it's not enough time to really get nauseous, but it's close. And then the clever bit of Spaceship Two is this thing called the shuttlecock. The back wings fold upward, and it helps stabilize the vehicles that re-enters the atmosphere. Although it's not going particularly fast, it's very easy to spin out of control. And so the shuttlecock posture allows them to establish, keep it stable until they get enough air that they can actually then glide down to a landing. And in theory, this is now a commercial product that you can pay $250,000 per seat. There are people waiting, but they never flew again. The FAA, there was some FAA violations in their initial flight, so they're making, working through things with the FAA. So they haven't really been around much. What's interesting about Richard Branson's thing on July 11th is that this other billionaire <laughs> had his rocket that's not at all penis shaped. <laughs> um, now this is New Shepard. Uh, Jeff has been working, running Blue Origin for decades now. And he's had this rocket for a long time, and he did a ton of tests on it. It is a fully reusable rocket, but he never flew anybody on it. And then suddenly he was in a rush to fly on it. And so like, uh, 10 days after Richard Branson thing, he finally flew on it with his brother and a couple of others. Again, it's a four-person vehicle, totally ballistic. It's much quicker because you don't have white knight to fly you up. So it's pretty much like six minutes up and down. Uh, the booster, of course, comes back, lands on its tail. Very impressive, very cool. Uh, and then you re-enter with the capsule. It puts a parachute, puff, a little puff of rocketry, just as it touches down to soften the touchdown. Thanks for playing. And again, and to his credit, they have flown this enough times that it's not even on television anymore because it's six minutes. Now, why were these two billionaires so active last year? Well, mostly because of this other billionaire. So Elon has actually changed the space industry. His Falcon 9 rocket represents a, a tremendous breakthrough in rocketry. It's not particularly innovative. What it was was actually new. He went and rounded up the best rocket folks that were frustrated with NASA and the other space programs and said, what would you do if you were you know, clean sheet, build a better rocket? That is Falcon 9, the most practical possible rocket, and it lowered the price of space by a great deal. Now, this has been going on for years. The big thing that everybody's excited about with Falcon 9 is that the lower stage recovers. So it takes off like a regular rocket, and then about two and a half minutes into flight, the first stage has expended the majority of its fuel, and it separates. The second stage now finishes going off to the space station. That was his original gig that he got, was doing resupply for the space station. Now he's taking crew up there as well, but he's also launched plenty of payloads. And then the lower stage, miraculously, and I do not say that sarcastically, because he's done it a hundred times now, lands back on the ground on its tail. The current record holder was established literally last week with the 13th landing of a booster. He tested them, was confident they'd be able to land them 10 times. Now they're ready to redo their tests to establish that they're reusable 15 times. Uh, and this has driven down the price of space flight, which is why we get to the real thing of what was going on here. Now, I need to clarify how different a Falcon 9 is from Spaceship 2 and New Shepard. Size is a good way to evaluate the difference, okay? These two little guys on the left are suborbital spacecraft. They get above the Kármán line, so technically in space, 
but they don't go fast enough to go into orbit. They just go up and they come right back down. The little payload at the top of that big rocket is what actually gets into orbit because this rocket spends most of its time flying sideways, trying to add the sufficient speed, about 25,000 miles per hour, roughly eight kilometers per second, to actually maintain an orbit essentially indefinitely. That's the difference, right? We've got these uh, 20 meter craft versus a 70 meter craft. Much, much bigger vehicle. Now, in September of last year, the first Falcon 9 flew a tourist payload. They took a crew dragon, and these four went up. Now, on the left is Jarek Eisenman, who's a billionaire. You may notice a theme here. Now, he's a bit of an adventurer, and he had, currently holds the record for the fastest flight time around the world in a single engine aircraft. And he's always done charity work in association with his, his various endeavors for doing fun billionaire things. And so when he thought, when he could make a deal to finally have a crew dragon, he decided to raise money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. This is a hospital in the United States that primarily treats uh, children with cancer for free. And so he put up the 100 million for the rocket and for the flight, and then he put another 100 million in to St. Jude's with an attempt to raise an additional 100 million through donation. And one of the things he did was he raffled off one of the seats. Pretty cool. Now he picked the other two passengers. Beside him is C.N. Proctor. C.N. Proctor is a, is a science teacher who very nearly was a NASA astronaut. She made final round a few years ago and had gone through a bunch of the training and so forth. Didn't quite make the cut for whatever reason. Lovely woman, uh, really fun to listen to, super smart. Beside her, the smallest one there, that's Haley Arsenault. Haley Arsenault uh, was a bone cancer survivor who was treated at St. Jude's and as she became an adult, went to work at St. Jude's helping kids with cancer. You can't not like Haley Arsenault, she's awesome, right? And so, yeah, he went. And the last guy is Chris. <laughs> so here's the deal. They have the lottery based by donation and somebody wins it and then decides they don't wanna go <laughs> and gives the ticket to Chris. Now, Chris is very into space. He's been he works for Lockheed Martin as a programmer. He's been volunteering at space camps and things like that. Now, here's the news, folks. He's us. He's a normal techno-human who now got a chance to go into space. And so they started the training, and pretty quickly you figure it out, whenever you saw a video of him, Chris is at the back. When they were doing the vomit comet, Chris was doing the vomiting. <laughs> he had a tough time, but they really did go up. They were supposed to go up for a week and they ended up going up for five days. And there's a bunch of reasons why that they're really not talking a whole lot about. The thing to remember, you know, what they took out, normally at the top of, this, uh, of the capsule there is a, uh, a docking port for going to the space station. They removed that and put this plexiglass dome in so you'd have this epic view. This is a render, it's a lie. Uh, but the real picture is this one. Now always the rule when you see a picture like this is who took this picture? Because it's on the outside. So what they did was they stuck a camera in the cap facing the plexiglass so that when they were actually gonna be in the plexiglass they could have a picture of themselves in the plexiglass. So good idea, great one, right? So few things that you quickly discover when you're inside of a Crew Dragon capsule. It's smaller than the inside of a minivan, and the bathroom's by the dome, and it's just got a kind of curtain around it, and you're up there for four days. <laughs> now, we, what they didn't know was that the astronauts that normally were taking it to the space station, which they'd only done twice at this point, had never touched the toilet because astronauts are like that. Astronauts are not normal humans. And so they just don't go. And the toilet leaked. Yeah, bad enough. You're, a, you're Chris, and you really got to go. And so you kind of got kind of a curtain around you in the minivan. 
God help you, got any gas. And then it's everywhere. And you're in free fall, so it's just sort of wandering around. <laughs> if you ever listen to the transcripts of the Apollo astronauts, and remember, those guys were all test pilots, right? I mean, they had a bunch of toilet problems. They did not have a toilet, for starters. When you had to go number two, you used a bag. And so they're, I mean, again, the Americans are kind of crazy this way. NASA published absolutely everything involved in this the, the flight, including the transcript of somebody going, is that a turd? <laughs> and as you hear one of the other guys go, yep, that's mine, I'm getting it. <laughs> but that's astronauts, they're not normal humans. Now, just recently, there's been another mission using Crew Dragon, uh, and that, this time it has a billionaire, actually it has four billionaires, although one of them is a former astronaut with NASA, Michael uh, Lopez. So uh, this was the Axiom mission to the space station. So the, this is getting into some serious terrorism. So these folks paid $55 million each for a week on the space station. It was supposed to actually be 10 days, but it ended up being 17 days because of bad weather. So they actually got to go to the station and do the thing, and there's some great footage of them. That's them and the Crew Dragon going up. And this, this is just April this year. And then there they are with the actual professional astronauts and the four of them in there as well. Yeah, you know, up and down is a kind of an optional thing in a space station, so. Uh, Axio, uh, the uh, Axiom Space is run by a bunch of folks that are ex-NASA space station folks. So it's a very serious company and now, there, there used to be tourism to the space station only through the Russian side on the Soyuz but this is now the American side doing it. They've got the next two flights sold. So apparently at least eight people have $55 million burning a hole in their pocket. And they're trying to sell the fourth flight. And we'll talk more about them later. But that really was, the fact is that tourism is starting. And it's no longer strictly billionaire territory. But I mean, 55 million bucks for a week or 10 days on space, that's a lot of money. But it's a beginning. I mean, this is how aircraft started. You know, airplanes were first toys for the rich. And then as they matured and became more reliable and more common, the prices start to go down. So, you know, Dennis Tito, who was the first civilian to go to the space station back in the early 2000s, spent $100 million to do it. And it, it was a ride on a Soyuz and so forth. And now it's, it's less, it's a little more scalable, and we're getting into an interesting time. So. That's what's, you know, we're in an interesting period now where this new Crew Dragon opens the door to another level of tourism, perhaps a, a hotel. We're making steps towards that. Uh, so those are kind of known rockets. Let's talk about some less developed rockets. Jeff Bezos, besides the little, uh, the, the little new Shepard, is building a larger rocket called the New Glenn. Now, uh, he's naming all of his rockets after astronauts. For those who are into rocketry, this is a mythological rocket. They've been talking about it for a decade. There has been one test article towed around Kennedy Space Center a couple of years ago. We've seen nothing else. It's a seven meter rocket. Uh, the diameter of rockets is really important in terms of our lifting capabilities and, and functionality. The Falcon 9 is quite a narrow rocket. It's 3.7 meters wide. And one of the limitations you have on rocketry is as long, you can't go too long for your width. At some point, it's called the fineness ratio. You get a, you got a problem with flexing moments. So normal ratio is 15 to one, and the Falcon 9 is at 18 to one. It is a very tall rocket for its width. They've, they, they've sort of tweaked the Falcon 9 out as absolutely as far as they can go. It is a very, very refined machine, and it can't go any farther. So most of the developments you're gonna see now in modern rocketry are larger. And that's why this one's a seven meter rocket. Uh, the, this, one of the side effects of the Falcon 9 has been that ULA, the United Launch Alliance, which used to operate the space shuttle and now primarily operates Atlas V and Delta IV rockets, is developing a new rocket called the Vulcan. So this is a modernization of those rockets and uh, it uses the same upper stage as Atlas V, but it is just an update to existing rocket technology. So, you know, Elon's effect on the industry has been to make everybody make a better rocket now. 
and everybody's supposed to have some kind of recovery strategy. The recovery strategy in the, in the Vulcan, which we have no evidence is actually going to happen, they're not going to try to save the tanks, but rather have the first stage engines be recovered. That the engines will actually separate from their tanks and they'll parachute down and be fetched by a helicopter in mid-flight, because that doesn't sound like a James Bond novel, but <laughs> okay, maybe it'll happen. We haven't seen either one of these rockets, really, and for the, exactly the same reason, which is this engine. This is the BE-4. This is being developed by Blue Origin. Blue Origin started talking about this engine almost 10 years ago. This is a methane oxygen engine. Most rocket engines, including the one for the Falcon 9, are kerosene and liquid oxygen, or what we call Carolox engines. The other type of common engine, well, not that common, but somewhat common, like on the space shuttle, are hydrogen and oxygen engines, or hydrolox engines. These are methylox engines. And we've really never developed methylox engines to this scale before. These are very high performance engines. They're about 600,000 pounds of thrust or somewhere around three meganewtons of thrust. And it's very hard to build an engine of that power class. And much less with a, with a fuel that's not that well, as well known and has not been pushed this far before. Hydrogen is a very cool fuel. It's super efficient, but hydrogen is very low density. So the tanks end up being huge and that's bad for lower stages. Also, hydrogen is nasty. It's hard to handle, it's hard to store, but it's very efficient. Kerosene is much simpler to store. It's very, very dense, so your tanks end up being smaller. Uh, but it is a refined petroleum product, and so it's hard to acquire, it's a little bit costly, uh, it, it has a problem with freezing, it gets too cold because it's, no, it's liquid at room temperature. Methane is in between the two. It's a cryogenic fuel. It cools down to the same level roughly as liquid oxygen, but not as much as liquid hydrogen. It's not naturally a liquid like kerosene is, and so it sort of gets the best of both worlds. It also has more efficient than kerosene, but not as efficient as hydrogen, but in general, it's easier to handle. But to get optimal performance from it, you have to run the engine at very high pressures, extraordinarily high, 300 atmospheres plus. And so, it's been a real struggle to make this engine. This engine is now years behind. And both New Glenn and Vulcan depend on this engine. So this has been delayed many times. They swear now, the last, the last bit of news, and I literally checked this today, was that they are assembling the first flight engines for the Vulcan uh, to be ready in 2021. Close. <laughs> so then it was like early 2022. Close. <laughs> so maybe this year? Now, there has been a, the, the pandemic did sort of do damage to, to Blue Origin. There's been a leadership change on the engine side and so forth. There's a new guy in charge. His name is John Vilja. He's famous uh, very, in, in rocketry circles. So he's had about 18 months to sort of get this in order. So we should now, I have some faith this engine's actually going to appear. Now, you may have been paying attention to the NASA side of things with this thing called the Space Launch System. So this is a rocket that's largely derived from space shuttle technology. Space shuttle was designed to be a fully reusable spacecraft, and it never was. Uh, it, the, the tanks were thrown away, the rocket boosters cost more to recover than it was to rebuild, and the shuttle itself basically had to be torn apart and rebuilt every single time it was flown. It was not an efficient vehicle, it was very, very costly. And so NASA, has been for many years proposed building a large rocket using the same tech. The shuttle weighed 100 tons. So what if you got rid of the shuttle part and just lifted a payload of 100 tons? That's roughly what this rocket is. So an extended version of the external tank, an extended version of the solid rocket boosters with a payload on top. It's not a bad idea if it was 1999. But because of the way American funding works, they've been fooling around with this rocket for literally 20 years. But with all the things that have gone on recently, they, this is a real picture of an actual test article. This is Artemis 1. And it has been going back and forth from the, the vehicle assembly building to fix some problems and then back out on the pad to attempt to do a fueling test several times. The last fueling test was last week. It had problems, but they declared success. So now tomorrow's announcement will probably be setting a date for when they're going to do a test fire. Not a flight, but a test fire. 
one of the problems they have is they've kept tanking and detanking this is that every time you do that, you stress the metal in the tank. It's entirely possible that they may admit the tank is now too damaged and they can't fly it anymore. I don't know. We literally will find out tomorrow. Um, but it's kind of archaic. There's no recoverability in it. This is the earliest version of it. That's the one on the left. I know they painted it white to make it look nice, but it's not. It's the, it's the orange color. Um, the upper stage is not powerful enough. It's an RL-10 Centaur booster. They need to build a more advanced one they call the Asus upper stage, which is what would make the rocket bigger and increase its payload if they're going to actually get to the moon with it. So they're miles away. And the current estimate is a billion and a half a flight, which is stunningly expensive when you think in terms of you could fly four people to the space station for 200 million bucks. So, but you know, the great thing about America is they have enough money to be this dumb. Uh, and then there's this rocket. Anybody following this? This is SpaceX's other project called Starship. If anybody else was doing this, it would be ridiculous. But Elon's goal is to build a 100% reusable spacecraft. His argument has always been, I mean, how dumb would it be to build an airplane that you fly from Los Angeles to Sydney and then throw the airplane away? But it's essentially what they do with rocketry, because it's always been a belief that it was the only way it was going to work. Now he's trying to build one where the lower stage flies back and lands his tail. We already know he knows how to do that. But the upper stage is a complete flying unit that then can re-enter and land. So for the past couple of years, we got, for a brief period, it was about a year and a half, we, they went from a little tank flying around, showing they could fly a tank around, to this thing. This was SN15, which was the first mock-up of the upper stage, the Starship stage, that flew up to 40,000 feet, then belly flopped down, pivoted and landed on the tail without exploding. He blew up a whole bunch of them, and it was really fun to watch. He's... <laughs> Because he's doing really much the old NASA way of doing things, which is bend the metal, fly it, wreck it, learn something, do it again, right? It's almost agile, right? It's just that the rollback's a bit more costly and involves more fragments of aluminum. Um, but what he's really done is perfected manufacturing these things quickly and constantly making improvements to them to the point where he said, hey, you can actually do this. Because the idea of free-falling or belly-flopping a rocket on its side with all the fuel in the wrong place, and then being able to get the engines to fire and get it the right way and be able to land again, it's just like, it's nuts. Why would you even try that? And it, except for that part where it worked, it would never work. <laughs> now he needs the lower stage, and so that's the largest booster that will ever have been built by man so far. And this is all happening in Texas, in a little area they call Boca Chica, right on the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, that's one of the tallest platforms they've ever built. The rocket, this is a nine meter rocket. It's really big. And I mean, if, compared, if you compare it to the biggest rockets ever made, it will be the largest rocket ever, so far. And in fact, this is, the video, this is a clip of them stacking it just to have had a stack. They immediately unstacked it, but to show, like, they're a big rocket, holy man. Now. Um, if you, again, if you're following this, there was an, an FAA review going on. This site at Boca Chica was originally being developed to fly Falcon Heavy, which was three Falcon 9 strapped side by side, which has flown a couple of times and it has its own problems, so we, we'll, we'll let that go. But now the, and the FAA took a long time to, to respond to this request. It took months, but just a couple of weeks ago, they finally came back and they, they asked for a bunch of mitigations, but they're pretty minor. But the bottom line is they're now on path to do some flying. Now, along, it hasn't been a, that bad of a deal because they've learned a lot while they've been not flying. They've been improving designs, and they've iterated a bunch of times. They're also building another site at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, which they now recognize is the most likely place for them to fly at long term. So one of the requirements from the FAA is that they would only do five orbital and five suborbital flights from this location per year. I don't expect they're going to do any suborbital flights ever if this thing works. There's a lot left to go uh, to, to really get this all the way, but the impact of it would be astonishing because it's a fully reusable rocket. Now you're talking about maintenance and fuel, not building new vehicles each time you fly. I mean, even when the Falcon 9 flies, you may get the first stage back, but you have to build a new upper stage every time. 
right? They're just not recoverable. They're moving too fast for you to get them back. So it's huge, and it should be one of the most astonishing noises ever when this thing actually flies. That lower stage has, will have 32 engines in it. They're the Raptor 2 engine, which is very much the equivalent of the BE-4, a half million pound thrust methyl ox engine. His seemed to work, although perhaps not at full power. He's already on the second major version of this engine while the BE-4 still struggles to ship a, a flight model. Uh, so he's a lot further along. That's a lot of engines to have together. So there's going to be an interesting set of acoustics and vibrations and so forth. Like there's a non-trivial chance the first time this thing tries to fly, it's going to blow itself to pieces. But we're all going to be there to watch, and he will fly it again. But the goal here is that the big beastie takes off. The lower stage burns for about two and a half minutes. That'll get him up somewhere in the neighborhood of three or four kilometers per second, maybe five kilometers a second, which is about halfway to orbit, and uh, or somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 kilometers up. Then the lower stage will separate, the upper stage will fire and continue to go, the lower stage will then turn around, fire its engines, try and get back home. Free fall back down towards the pad and be caught by the landing pad, because that's not insane. <laughs> They call them the chopsticks, a pair of arms on the side of the launch platform. They're going to reach out and grab that rocket and put it down. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then the lower stage, the upper stage, when it comes back from orbit, and it's never traveled this fast before, so Mach 25, I mean, that's orbit velocity. So it's going to belly flop into the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, start decelerating. It's got a heat shield and so forth on it and then eventually get into its belly flop position before it finally belly flops towards the base, pivots, and lands. Oh, now, now he's saying, I don't want landing gear on that either, so the chopsticks are going to catch this part too. Okay. If it wasn't Elon, I'd just be laughing. It's just the guy keeps being right, at least about space stuff. Virtually everything else he's wrong about, but I'm not going to take the guy's advice for crypto, but... <laughs> But the space stuff he's done pretty well on. So this is the only table I've got in this whole deck. And it's a breakdown of the rough potential of each of these rockets. So Saturn V is long gone, but adjusted for current dollars. It lifted, between, depending on who you ask, between 120 and 140 metric tons at roughly a price of about 5,400 US dollars per kilo. The space shuttle, which could only lift about 29 metric tons, although that most of the space station one piece at a time, uh, most expensive vehicle by far. Now, that's a, that is a very accurate price, and that's the all-in cost of developing the space shuttle, building the five of them, flying them 135 times, blowing up two of them, killing 16 people, and uh, shutting the program down. So, by an economic perspective, a disaster. From, an, from a learning perspective, phenomenal. I mean, it's taught so much in the space industry. The Hubble Space Telescope was only possible with the shuttle. Like, there's a bunch, the shuttle did remarkable things. But Dan Golden, who was in charge of, the, uh, the, of NASA at the time of the end of the shuttle, said, if we had never built shuttle and just spent the money we spent on shuttle continuing to fly Saturn Vs, not even improving anything, we would have had six Saturn V flights a year, including three to the moon, the whole time. So, I mean, he really sunk a lot of money. And we, obviously, we would have improved things. Falcon 9's numbers speak for themselves. That's the breakthrough, where regular commercial rockets like the Atlas Vs typically ran between twenty dollars and $25,000 a kilo. Falcon 9, it was at 2600 a kilo and going down. Falcon Heavy, uh, which can carry a lot more payload because it's the three rockets together, even cheaper. Although its biggest problem is that its payload fairing is not big enough for the payloads it's capable of carrying. It only has a four meter payload fairing that's only about eight meters high, and you don't have anything that weighs 50 tons that fits in there. Or, you know, like a block of concrete, but who wants to fly that? He did fly a, 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 his Tesla into orbit, but that's because he's a nut and they only weigh two metric tons. The rest are speculative. New Glenn and Vulcan have not flown, but this is what they're proposing. The space launch system, the early one, which only about 90, uh, 95 metric tons at 15,000 a kilo. If Starship is fully reusable, 
based on the maintenance costs and refueling costs, so the fuel is actually pretty cheap, depending on who you ask, the price is between $7 and $1,000 a kilo. You know, it's 55 million bucks to ride the Crew Dragon to the space station. Now you'd be talking about $50,000, maybe even $5,000 to fly to the space station. Like now it's a first class ticket. Like that's pretty revolutionary. And Starship's also massive. If you had to rebuild the International Space Station using Starship, four flights. It holds a lot of volume. It's a long way from working, don't get too excited. One of the things that's brilliant about, about SpaceX and the way they do things is actually Starlink. Because Starlink is also a way they test their rockets. Whenever they're gonna fly a rocket for the most number of times, they fly their own payload, they fly Starlink payloads. And so that's how they've been able to build their network as quickly as they have. It's always been part of a test. They also load the Falcon 9 up to its absolute limit. Right? They're stressing the rocket the most with their own payloads. And everything we've seen so far with Starship, they're gonna do the same thing. They're building bigger versions of the Starlink satellites. They're gonna put more of them into to Starship. And so they're gonna expand that network even more and stress their rocket over and over and over again before they put any other commercial payloads into it. It's a good plan. It's hard to refute, but it's still taking big chances. So that's all I got to say about rocketry. Let's talk about the space station. So for the most part, most people are only really familiar with the International Space Station. There have been many others over the years. The, the Russians flew far more space stations than the Americans ever did. They had all of their, their whole Salyut series, which culminated into a space station called Mir, uh, that, the, uh, that then lasted past the end of the Soviet Union and the, uh, the space shuttle used to go there. Uh, Mir was eventually re-entered. You know, space stations get old and fragile and uh, kind of unmaintainable, and they eventually have to be re-entered, and that's going to happen to this one, too. First components of the space station were flown in 1999. Um, and there, we, we are now having conversations about the Russian quarter, the back half of the space station, having serious cracks in it. They're some of the oldest components, and, uh, are, and they're not essentially repairable. So they continue to do upgrades to the station. These front components are uh, European and Japanese, and they're in pretty good shape. They've put new solar panels over top of the old ones to increase the total amount of power availability. The original plan was to operate the space station until 2026. They look like they're gonna get an extension to 2030. But that's about all the time we've got with this space station. But, uh, and now the Chinese have flown a space station called Tanxian, and it, ha it is based on a Russian design. Right? The Russian core module is the same, which also what's running this one. This is a Russian core module as well. And all the Salyuts were Russian, and the Mir was Russian. In fact, the only space station that wasn't Russian at all was Skylab, and it re-entered here. So, uh, but NASA has now announced uh, commercial space stations. They don't want to be in the space station mission business anymore. One of the revolutions that made this International Space Station far more cost efficient than it had been was the commercial transport contracts. So the resupply of the station was run with commercial contracts. So what's the difference? The typical contract for space flight is what's called a cost plus contract, which basically says spend whatever you need to spend to achieve this impossible goal, and if you get it done on time, we'll give you some extra money. Now they, that seems like a reasonable thing when you're doing something completely original. The downside to it is that once you've done it once and they ask you to do it again, you're gonna do it exactly the same way because you're not paid to make it better. You're paid to do it over and over again, reliably. And so it never reduces costs. The commercial contracts actually said, hey, we need, the, each year we need a certain number of flights to the space station with a certain amount of supply. We'd like a certain amount going up and a certain amount going down. This is how much we're willing to pay you per ton. Figure it out. Once you get the contract, how much you make is up to you. So now, the, the, the vendor is incented to reduce costs, and they have. It's not just SpaceX, so Orbital Sciences, which is now a part of Northrop Grumman, flies their Antares rocket with the, Cygnus, uh, um, with the Cygnus orbiter to resupply the space station as well. So they're gonna do the same thing with space stations in general. 
they want to have multiple space stations. There's a bunch of different things you can do with space stations, and they don't get along with each other. So it's actually better to have a few different ones. And the International Space Station has serious problems, one of which is it's too big. They have a lot of time, they waste a lot of time trying to find stuff on the space station. There's so many storage locations, and there's so much stuff on the space station that actually keeping accurate inventory of things, like, it's a problem. They always thought they'd get more and more efficiency out of having more people on the station, and it turned out largely not to be true. Now, part of that is a flaw in the design of the station. This station has to be continuously occupied. There's a lot of maintenance that can only be done by people. But most of the technological design of the station is from the 70s and 80s. Right? This was originally Space Station Freedom, as specified by Ronald Reagan. And so the technology is very dated. And this, modern stations will never be like this again. They will be man-tended. They'll be completely autonomous, can operate and maintain and, uh, and control themselves, and people can come and hang out on them once in a while if they want. And that's why they're going to make them smaller and make more of them. So there's a bunch of companies that have put in proposals for space stations. One of the, the biggest one, and the craziest one, I think, is the one called Orbital Reef. This is Blue Origin working with Boeing and Sierra Space. This would actually be three of their stations attached together. The central cores are all seven meters wide because they're based on New Glenn, the rocket that still hasn't flown. The inflatable modules come from Sierra Space. They're really great technology, the, the inflatable modules. And then uh, we've got a Starliner there, which finally flew badly. And uh, we have a Sierra Systems uh, winged Dior, uh, lander on the end there. So the idea behind Orbital Reef is to make a very modular system where people can put different payloads onto it, do different kinds of experiments. It's cool design from a group of companies that do have a pretty good idea of what they're doing. So this one may actually come true. Uh, one of my favorite ideas in all of this from, the, from that group is from Genesis Engineering. It's a one-man spacecraft. So basically a little cylinder that you slide through an airlock into close off, and then can separate from a station, go outside, and you have remote op op uh, actuators to actually manipulate things in here. Um, we, we've needed this on the space station for a while. We use spacesuits, which are basically self-contained spacecraft, but they're flexible, and they're wearing out. The American suits that are on the station now were all built in the shuttle era. There are no replacements. They now are working hard to try and get some because they thought these ones would last until the end of the station, and they haven't. They leak. And when they leak, they drown astronauts. There's been a few astronauts who have had the experience of somewhere in the system it's leaking water and it just starts building up on your face, and you can't get it off because you're in a helmet. And uh, Luca Pastrano actually got to the point where he was literally blowing the bubble water off of his mouth to get a breath of air, completely blinded, on the outside of the space station and still had the presence of mind to remember where he was and blindly find his way back to the airlock, get inside and pressurize it before he drowned. But when the, uh, when the guys inside the station got to him, they basically yanked the helmet off and his face was completely encased in water. He was holding his breath at that point. Awesome. But really stuff that should be on TV, not in the space station. So the Genesis module just looks like a more reliable system for when you actually need human eyes in a location. Although there's a bunch of robotics ways to do this as well. Uh, Lockheed Martin and NanoRacks have proposed StarLab, again, an inflatable module. But the cool part of this are these little, uh, they've got, they want to use little nanobots to do the maintenance on the outside. So, you know, small stations that men can go and visit periodically and uh, can do the work on. There's a bunch of different kinds of things you want to do on space stations. One of them is experimentation with artificial gravity using uh, centrifuges. There was originally a centrifuge proposed for the International Space Station, but it, it interferes with the microgravity experiments because it shakes the whole station. So they never actually put it in. But we need to learn more about building artificial gravity. We need to build rotating structures. If we're going to go to Mars, we're going to need some kind of artificial gravity. It's not going to work any other way. The one thing the space station has taught us is the humans suck in zero G. All right? we, keep a, we keep the typical trip of the space station down to six months because that seems to be the most recoverable. But if you're going to be six months on the space station, you exercise two and a half hours every day. And you'll still take a year to recover. 
Now, most peristaltic systems inside your body work just fine in free fall, right? Your blood pumps, your food digests, all that stuff works. You can't burp because the food floats around in your stomach. If you burp, it gets dramatic. Although, I have seen a video of an astronaut explaining how you do burp on the space station, which is that you back up against the wall, and then you accelerate yourself and let the gas out. And if you get it wrong, you have to clean it up. <laughs> but there's one part of your body that isn't peristaltic, and it is your cerebral spinal fluid. So there are two little organs in your brain that produce a fluid that bathes your brain and cleans it. And that fluid typically flies down your spine where it does exchange with your urinary system and you pee out the debris. And, the, and even bedridden patients, nurses sit them up every day and it's specifically around that cerebral spinal fluid. If you sit up each day, that'll move that fluid around and it'll keep you healthy. But that fluid doesn't move when you're in free fall. And so the fluid builds up in your head, which is why you, every astronaut you ever see is kind of puffy. But the fluid gets the, so much in, in your head that it starts to press against their eyes and it bends them to the point where they have different, when they go up, they have multiple pairs of glasses like readers because their eyes change shape over the course of the flight. And then when you finally go back down, your eyes will bend back but never the same. Uh, you also haven't walked on your feet for six months, so your feet really hurt. But you've seen them get out, out of the Soyuz capsules at the end of six months and they need to be carried out. Which begs the question, if we were really going to go to Mars without artificial gravity, it's about a six-month flight. And you get to Mars, there's nobody else there. And it takes a year to recover. That maybe makes no sense. We need to mature artificial gravity solutions. And this opportunity to build multiple space stations is part of that. It would give us a chance to do it. Now, I saved one more space station idea for the last. And it's those Axiom guys again. So they're the ones who've already flown a crew to the station. They also want to fly components to the station. They want to build a recreational area, a tourist area on the International Space Station in the next couple of years. They are actually building the first component right now. They have permission from NASA to do this. And after they get up to four components, they should be able to make their own free-flying space station. So their goal is to build out the station connected to ISS and use it as they go making money by you know, running tourist trips into this area. So you'll have your own play area. You don't have to go play with the scientists. And then when they're done, they'll have their own station. Although now, just recently, I've seen the first papers discussing that when this station leaves, some of the components from the ISS may go with it. The latest labs, the Columbus and the, uh, and the Japanese module, may be pulled off to go with the Axiom space station. It's interesting. And really an interesting way, those are the newest components. They've got a few more years in them, so it might make sense to give them a new lease on life. So we should have some, next 10 years should be really interesting with all of, all of these evolution of these different components. So let's talk a bit about the moon. Now, this is my favorite picture of the moon. Rule number one, whenever looking at a photograph, who took this picture? Because <laughs> this is a funny spot to take a picture from. That is the far side of the moon. It's clearly not the dark side of the moon, because A, not dark. Uh, and, uh, and, and B, you know, they, the light goes around it. That's why you have a new moon. Where's that light? It's on the other side. This photograph, and it is a photograph, was taken by the Discovery Satellite. And the Discovery Satellite is a solar weather satellite. It sits at L1, about a million and a half kilometers away from the Earth, looking primarily at the, at the sun. It watches for sunspots and uh, solar flares, things like that, gives us early warning if there's problems. And somebody was clever enough to put a telescope on the other side, pointing at the Earth, because it literally sits between the Earth and the sun. It always has a full disk view of the sun. And so when Discover is operating normally, and sometimes it isn't, it continuously takes pictures of the Earth. Now, it is a telescope. You're a million and a half kilometers away from the Earth, so it's really small. But, and it all, you know, in, up, up in space, we don't really take normal color pictures. What we do is we have a black and white sensor and then we put different filters in front of it. And so, because it's so far away, it takes a while to take ima each image, it's about 20 seconds, and you have to take four of them. And so, over that time, when the Earth, when the moon passes across the Earth, it's booking it. It just whizzes across. And if you get really close to this picture, you'll see right on the right-hand edge is a little bit of a green band. That's because the green pack filter is to use last, and the moon had moved. CGI doesn't do that. CGI would be perfect. This is a real photograph. It's not perfect. 
We know about the Apollo missions. We know that the, this was uh, the Americans doing a thing against the Soviets. It was, we're cooler than you. There are other versions of that. Any question of whether or not it was a military mission wrapped in science, look at the group of folks that went. 11 of them are test pilots. One of them is not. It's this guy in the bottom right here. This guy. That's Jack Schmidt. Geologist. He was supposed to be on Apollo 18, but there wasn't an Apollo 18. Remember that the point of Apollo was to demonstrate that American technology and American capability was superior to the Soviets. The Soviets had beaten them into orbit. They had beaten the, the Soviets beat them, uh, the first woman in space. They had beaten them in, in doing interceptions in space. They beat them on a lot of things. And the Americans had to pick a goal hard enough that they had a chance to catch up, and that was landing on the moon. And obviously, they pulled it off and proved the point, for better or worse. But the moment they'd done it, doing it anymore was kind of stupid. Right? And so they started quite pretty quickly. There was the, the Apollo 8, which was the mission where they went and they orbited the moon and came back, was the point at which the Americans were now in the lead. And there was a serious argument about, we should stop now. We're now leading. We've made our point. Let's stop taking chances. Let's stop. And it was like, ah, Kennedy's been shot. You know, we got to make it good for Jack. Let's land him on the moon. But after Apollo 11, which was very nearly failed, uh, very nearly failed, extremely dangerous mission, it really didn't make sense to continue. They still did a few more. But as they started, they were supposed to go out to Apollo 20, and they started cutting missions. And when they cut, and you know, there was always pressure on, we've got to make this a science thing. It's supposed to be a science thing. You can't just fly test pilots all the flipping time. Let's get a scientist up there. Now, Jack Schmidt had been teaching these test pilots how to do geology on the moon. But you only teach test pilots so much. They're not rock guys. And so, but they were going to send him up as well. And then when they cut Apollo 18, they said, well, we got to fly the geologist. So they moved him up to Apollo 17, and he got to go. Here's a picture of Jack on the moon. A few things you can notice about him. A, really dirty, because he likes rocks, and he was down in the rocks a lot. <laughs> See all that stuff on the top of his helmet there? Right there. See that? So on the left arm of an Apollo astronaut, there are procedure cards. So they literally have every minute of their time on the moon, and they only had three days on the moon, planned out, all of the experiments they're supposed to do and so forth. Now Jack is a geologist, so he really likes looking at rocks. And so he kept lifting that gold visor up so he could see the rocks properly. Now the problem is the sun will literally burn his retinas out if he looks at the sun by accident. And so, and you can hear this if you ever listen to the transcripts of it. Every time, they actually have a picture of him with the visor up. It's the only time you've ever seen Apollo astronaut with his actual face showing in the helmet. He's got a big grin on his face because, you know, he's on the moon. Uh, and he's looking at the rocks, and they keep telling him, hey, Jack, when you get a sec, would you put your visor down, please? You idiot. Right? So Jack started ripping off the procedure cards as they finished them and sticking them in the side of his helmet so the sun wouldn't blind him because he really wanted to look at the rocks. That's what Jack was doing. And Jack found, by far, the most important rocks on the moon that told us a ton about what actually happened on the moon because he was a geologist. And science isn't done by Eureka, I found it. Science is done by, what the hell is that? He had to know enough about rocks to know the exception was there. And he was able to find the exceptions. I mean, that's what ha humans are built for this, right? We're wired to explore environments. We're brilliant at it. We only had one chance for three days to put a real scientist on the moon, and all he did was breakthroughs the whole time he was there, and very nearly blind himself. But, you know, details. <laughs> we got to do that again. This was the liability. The lunar excursion module had so many failure modes in it that were unrecoverable. And it only had material, food and supplies for three days. And it took at least three days to launch a rescue mission. There was no way to save those astronauts if anything went wrong. The technology just wasn't there yet. Yeah, I know we pulled it off. Incredibly dangerous. But technology's advanced. So the new mission's called Artemis. Artemis was the sister to Apollo. Nothing clever. Uh, and their intent is to use that silly rocket to go back to the moon. Now, that rocket's got lots of problems, but it could carry enough payload. Now, the Canadians are going. Our, our, our ability, our, our skill set is in building robotic arms. And so we've done it, we did it for the shuttle, we did it for the space station, and we're going to do it for, for these missions as well. 
Canada spends money on the technology needed for the missions, and in exchange, occasionally, they get to send an astronaut. And everybody remembers Chris Hadfield, who got to run the space station, and he played the guitar, and everybody likes him. You know, Canadian, what are you going to do? Uh, the Aussies are in, too. So a couple years ago, you signed up to the Artemis program, and you're going to be doing a bunch of robotics. In fact, you've now committed to a semi-autonomous rover on the moon to collect soil samples and ice and do experiments on them inside of your rover. And the same thing, you're going to be doing a bunch of missions related to the moon with the hope that there will be an Aussie on the moon at some point. If all this goes down as planned. So the new moon approach is to build a space station around the moon. Now A, NASA wants a do-over. They're not happy with their current space station. They want to try something else. But here's the clever part about building this. They know how to do it. They do want to improve on the station, and they know how to get to and from this very easily. Getting to and from the surface of the moon is a heck of a lot more tricky, but getting to an orbit around the moon is not. Plus, this is an international mission. The Canadians, the Australians, the Japanese, the Europeans, all contributing to this. The Americans tend to cancel stuff when they don't have international agreements to operate it. So the reason a space station got, they could never get around to building their own space station, but as soon as they got the other countries involved, they had to finish it. So this is the setup. If we build this, if we make the agreements this way, then we have to build it. Once you build it, you gotta kinda use it. So it's literally a political game to actually get us doing stuff on the moon. Now the moon's gravity is a little unstable, and so, and I'll explain why in a bit. So the orbit of this station is not what you think. It's not just gonna go around the moon. It's actually gonna orbit top to bottom, I've got an animation of it, which is cool. Um, so it's literally going to come tight over the north pole of the moon and then whiz way far down from the south pole of the moon and then come back up again and do it again. Over and over and over again. Now, what's great about this orbit? Right? It's called a near rectilinear halo orbit, which is fun to say. First off, the station always has a view of the Earth, so you're never out of radio communication. Second off, it almost always, like 98.7% of the time, has a view of the sun, so it always has solar power. You know, one of the things that's hard on the International Space Station is that it literally goes between sunlight and darkness every 45 minutes. So those solar panels are charging batteries for 45 minutes, then you're discharging those battery packs for 45 minutes, and then you repeat. Like, you try that with your batteries. This is not a small thing to do. So this makes for a much simpler station. And it means we have an anchor near the moon to put, station all the supplies for an extended stay on the moon. And with any luck, we'll actually build a dedicated lander that will hang out on the station as well. So then you bring uh, uh, your astronaut, you bring up your supplies and keep them at the station. Then you bring up your, your lander and you keep it at the station. And then you bring your astronauts who take their supplies in their lander and they go down to the moon and they have an extended stay. It's how you solve that problem. Instead of trying to cram it all into one rocket, you can assemble it over time. The station is the anchor to that. A few different station designs out there. This is actually a proposal for using Falcon Heavy and a larger version for doing resupply to the station. So the same way they have the commercial resupply for the space station in orbit around the Earth, they would have commercial resupply for the station around the moon. Again, we're leveraging what we know how to do so we can do more routine missions and get better at it, right? We're starting to build infrastructure. Uh, a couple of years ago, NASA asked for different landing systems. Uh, none of them are great. They, their specifications were pretty clear. They said we want a fully reusable landing system. You know, the lunar excursion module would land on the moon, but it would leave the lower half behind, and the, up, the ascent stage would go up behind. If you want to have a base on the moon, you can't keep leaving pieces of your car behind. It's just not practical. And so three companies put together fairly thorough proposals, including SpaceX. Let's talk about each one of them. So Dynetics lander was pretty cool. It, was, it would be lifted in one launch on an Atlas V and was almost completely reusable. On the outside edges of it were a separate set of tanks for providing enough fuel for it to actually deorbit and land, but it would have to drop those tanks. This is probably acceptable, except for that part when they actually analyzed the lander thoroughly and said it had negative mass, which is to say it was so heavy it couldn't actually fly or land. <laughs> Oops, okay. So that one didn't get accepted. 
Let's talk about Blue Origin and ULA collaborated over this nightmare rocket. Remember it was supposed to be 100% reusable? That's the only part that was reusable. This is the navigation stage, which will fly you to the moon. This is the landing stage, which will get you down, and that's the part to get you back up. So you got parts everywhere. I mean, did you read the specs? <laughs> the only thing I'd say in favor of this design is that this is all known design. Like, there's no question they could build this. It just doesn't actually do what you want it to do. But they made some lovely graphics. The other thing notice is that in order to have more payload and so forth, the thing's bloody tall. Look how long that ladder is. Don't miss your step. It's a long way down, even at 1.6 G. Actually, the most bizarre thing in this picture is that that dude's kneeling. Because you can't kneel in a spacesuit. You can't. It's inflated. You can't bend. You ever watch the, the, those astronauts on the moon? They sort of hop around, right? The gravity's low, and you can't bend that far. But they swear they can make suits that do that. I just don't believe them. Anyway, that's that design, and they actually have been forced to maintain that design, even though they don't think it makes sense. So this is the one that won. This is a modified version of Starship to be a lunar lander. So what's in its favor? First off, it's a single piece. Nothing falls off it. It doesn't break apart. It has excess capacity. This should be able to move about 100 tons down to the moon. Uh, the downside is the bloody thing's like 60 meters high. <laughs> These are all tanks down here. This is all tankage. Like they don't have a ladder down because you need an elevator. <laughs> and, and there's also, the, you see these little holes right here. That's the landing engine. So rather than use the big engine at the bottom, which would blow a big hole in the moon when you try to land on it, this engine's fairly high up to sort of carefully put it down. But you better find a, a level landing site because that is a, t it's a skyscraper. But it's the best offer they have, and it may even be possible. Like, Elon is bending metal to make this vehicle. And it, it actually has plenty of capacity. So that's interesting. Uh, I talked a bit about the gravity problems, and the gravity problems are really important. So back in 2011, there was a mission called GRAIL, where they used two satellites to map out the, a detailed gravity map of the moon. Again, if you listen to the transcripts of Apollo, and you know the story of Apollo 11, how Neil took control of the craft and landed the last second because that makes her better TV. The problem was that the gravity of the moon is irregular enough that they overflew their landing site. Now, they started the burn to land on the moon on the opposite side of the moon. Right? It's, it's half an orbit to actually come all the way down. And they knew exactly where they were flying. They'd mapped everything out. And so they're timing landmarks as they go by. So within the first five minutes after the burn, Neil says, we're long. Right? What she's saying is, I've just hit my next milestone like 30 seconds too soon. And the reason was there was more gravity where they're flying, it accelerated the spacecraft. Now, the spacecraft doesn't know that because it it's not smart enough to navigate. And by the way, it's 1968, right? So by the time they get down to the point where it's supposed to be landing, he's several kilometers further than he wanted to go. And he's now landing in a pile of boulders that are going to smash his spacecraft, and that would be bad. And so he takes control, finds a landing site, lands it successfully. And we've always found that whenever you put anything in orbit, low Earth orbit around, or lower moon orbit, you lose it. Because the gravity is irregular enough, it, it disrupts it to the point where it hits the moon. And so GRAIL mapped out the moon's gravitational field in extreme accuracy. And this is one of the maps they made. So the red areas are additional gravity, and the blue areas are less gravity. And it's only a variation of about 2%, but that's enough to screw everything up. But it also speaks to how do you build a base on the moon if you can't get back there <coughs> reliably, right? We need more precise, <coughs> precise navigation on the moon to be able to go back routinely. So the European Space Agency has proposed a, a system called Moonlight, or essentially GPS for the moon. Uh, also cellular communications for the moon. So it's a set of satellites that would orbit around the moon and do station keeping. They'd need some maintenance, but they would allow uh, communications across, all the way around the moon. So you can be on the backside of the moon, still be able to communicate elsewhere, as well as from Earth to the moon. So it would simplify the communications infrastructure for any vehicle operating around the moon, as well as allow for precise navigation. 
It's just part of the process if we're really going to utilize the moon. And these are all steps to build a base on the moon. This is what Elon drew when he thought it would be based on the moon. I looked at that and thought, Burning Man. <laughs> Actually, then I thought Space 1999. Remember Moon Base Alpha? Kind of looked the same, right? But you remember this show? Don't ever watch it. Your memories of it as a child are vastly superior to the actual show. We were young when we watched this show, and it was great. It was never great. We just didn't know better. And you will ruin a childhood memory if you watch it now. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <laughs> and it's probably not where we're going to build it all. The European Space Agency proposal, remember that? That started this whole thing off with the moon base? This is what they were talking about. Taking an inflatable habitat with an airlock, soft landing it on the moon, and then using robots to bury it in up to a meter of regolith to protect from radiation. Infinitely more practical solution and more likely. Although a step past that would be to actually use lava tubes. So one of the things that our, our friend, um, the geologist showed was that there was volcanic activity on the moon. There are eruptions, that's what the, the, the seas are on the moon, that smooth part are balsatic, balsatic eruptions that came, covered the moon and smoothed it out. And they had, so they actually had flows that ran under the ground and then they burst out in certain spots. And so scattered around the moon are these things called skylights. This is the Marius skylight. So the Marius skylight is about um, 400 meters across. This is a big hole that goes down, or it's 65 meters across and at least 80 meter deep and runs a better part of a kilometer. Uh, the Japanese are currently working on a mission to put a rover into this skylight. They want to land beside it precisely, which is tricky, and then drive a rover off of it on a cable and take a look down. But the you really want to build a base on the moon, you would take an inflatable habitat, you would get it down there, slide it in the tube and inflate it in there. You got natural radiation protection, you got a skylight, you know, it would be a pretty functional way to go, and you could build real space out of this. We, we wouldn't be struggling with every bit of structural detail. We also need power. The, uh, the way that the moon rotates means that you, a given location close to the equator has 14 Earth days of sun followed by 14 Earth days of night. So like bring battery packs. Uh, just this week, NASA announced a nuclear fission solutions for the moon. They put out Three, they selected three companies to build them. They're based on a design that the Glenn, Space, uh, the Glenn Center has been working on for many years called codename Krusty, which is a good name. Uh, the Krusty stands for kilowatt reactor using sterling technology, and they include the Y at the end, Krusty. So this is about six foot tall. There's a core of uranium that's about the size of a roll of kitchen towel and it's got a control rod in it, and it otherwise it's completely dry, it's designed to operate in, uh, in a vacuum. You'd pull the control rod from it and it actually heats up a set of pipes around it that have sodium uh, salts in them. They then flow up to a Stirling engine, which then uh, spins and generates electricity. This would be generate about 10 kilowatts of electricity and about 40 kilowatts of heat for 10 years, unsupervised, you'd basically, Stick it in the ground, turn it on, plug it in. Uh, they're completely solid state. The Stirling engine has minimal moving parts. It radiates its own heat in a vacuum, so it can't really overheat. It's got enough, not enough material to do so. So they, they matured this over the past few years. I saw a pictures of a prototype from 2017. That's the Stirling engine part. So they know it works. So they basically said, here's our design. Mature us a 40 kilowatt version and they put it out to three companies to tender, and that would provide you with reliable power anywhere in space, really. You don't care about light or dark, any of those things. So we are in an interesting time. Uh, space flight has never been cheaper. All right, I'm not gonna say it's never been safer, it's still pretty unsafe, but we're getting better at having options uh, and solutions for, for various problems. The space stations are gonna completely change in the next 10 years, as the end of the International Space Station comes and the new generation stations come along. And we may well get back on the moon before the decade is out. Don't believe any of the other schedules. It ain't gonna be 2024 and probably not even gonna be 2028. I'm, our, I'm gonna go see the first Artemis launch, which likely will be this year or early next year, but also because I think it's gonna be the only one. They planned four, but it's 
But if Starship flies before it, it's really hard to justify keep flying that thing. So I, I wouldn't miss it. It's going to be awesome. But uh, we're in a cool time. If you like these and you haven't ever listened to the Geek Outs, here's a shortcut link for the Geek Outs, geekout.show. So that's a subset of the .NET Rocks episodes that are called Geek Outs. The last ones I made were from the beginning of this year, uh, the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. I did three back-to-back. -back. Space, there's a lot of the stuff I just talked about. Uh, the pandemic and what we currently knew, and alternative energy, which is another area I spent a lot of time in. I hope you had a good week. I really had a great time being back in Melbourne. Thank you. See you again. <laughs>